I told this story on Christmas Eve of 2011. I know most of you probably weren't here. The rest of you, I'm counting on a shoddy memory. But if you do remember it, tough rocks, you're going to hear it again because it serves our purposes. So our family moved here in 2011, and it's not my wife's thing, so I took the kids to the Enchantment in the Park light display, and this is when it was still down at the fairgrounds. And one of the main reasons we wanted to go is because a bunch of Area Wells churches were doing a nativity scene, a living nativity. And we got down there, and it was great. I mean, the set was wonderful, costumes, everything was just fantastic. And the way it worked is the narrator would read parts of Luke 2 that we just read, and then the people would act it out. Well, it was all going fine until the shepherds got involved. So they came, and they worshipped Jesus and did all that good stuff. And then the narrator said that line in Luke where the shepherds went and told everyone what they had seen and heard. So to mimic this, the shepherds kind of worked their way through the crowd, delivering their message. First guy to speak gets right in the middle of the crowd, and what does he yell out? Christ is risen. <laughs> Kids were in third and fifth grade at the time, and they looked at me like the guy said a cuss word, like, <gasps> and there were confused people like, what in the world is going on? I didn't stop this guy. He keeps going, Christ is risen. He yells it even louder. And you can see the other shepherds are freaking out. So they run over, one grabs his coat, pulls him close, and you see like a look on the guy's face. He realized what he had done. So now what does he say? Not Christ is risen. Instead, having problems with this again? Ginny, oh, there we go. He yells out, the Savior's born. He finally got it right. Now, overall, it was a funny thing, and I know the guy was embarrassed, but he gave us all, you know, a good story to tell for years to come. But as I was driving home that night, I really appreciated the seeming blunder. Obviously, it was Christmas then, it's Christmas now, and we know what we're here to do. We are here to celebrate the birth of our Savior, the most important birth in the history of humanity. We love celebrating that, and we love celebrating it here. Because what do we do here? We have beautifully decorated churches. Jeannie, I might need you to take over. How about when I give you one of those? We go with it. We love beautifully decorated churches. Next one. We love the songs and carols. We wait 11 months to sing them. And we just love the general feeling of Christmas joy. And it's not just this flaky joy. It's a joy built on something real and true. A Savior came into this world for us. So absolutely, positively, on a day like today, we gather here and we shout out, a Savior is born. But imagine this. Imagine next April. A bunch of churches get together and they do a passion play. Can you imagine, as Jesus is suffering, next one please, as he is about to even die maybe, imagine somebody up on stage yelling out this. Next one. The Savior is born. Imagine that. Imagine right at the time of Christ's crucifixion, somebody in the background yells, a Savior is born. That would seem totally inappropriate, right? It would almost seem absolutely wrong. On Christmas, we shout out, yes, that our Savior is born. We don't do that on Easter. We don't do that on Good Friday. On Good Friday, we do decorate the church, but it's not like this. It's a much more solemn decoration. And while I hope people enjoy coming to a Good Friday service, happiness and joy are not the emotions we're experiencing as we leave. Instead, church is kind of dark. The songs are in minor keys. Sometimes we even leave this place in silence. As we're doing that, at the end of a Good Friday service, to yell out a Savior is born seems just as inappropriate as yelling Christ is risen on Christmas. But the more years I get away from that, I wish I knew who that shepherd was because I'd love to go shake his hand and say, buddy, you nailed it. You absolutely got it right. As we said in the opening, you can't just celebrate Christmas. You can't just take one part of Jesus' life and focus on that because when you look at any part, you have to look at it all. And it all goes together, his work, his life, his mission. And what was that mission? That mission was to save. It's just that simple. That's what Paul talks about in the verse, one verse that we're focusing on from Galatians 4. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law 
that we might receive the full rights of sons. There's a lot in there, so let's unpack it. At first he says, when the time had fully come, for years and years, ever since the fall, God had promised a Savior. It was a time of waiting. The people waited and waited, and God sent prophet after prophet to tell them the Savior is still coming. But on that day in Bethlehem, God decided the time is right. The time had fully come. Next, it says that when the time had fully come, God sent his son. Do you know why my family and I don't get together and celebrate the birthday of my brother, Alfred? (laughs) Because I don't have a brother named Alfred. He doesn't exist. He was not born. Therefore, there is no reason to celebrate. Well, when the time had come, God did send his son, the Savior, true God. He came into this world for us, and that's whose birthday we're celebrating. And he said, God sent his son born of a woman. This may sound like a throwaway line because, well, of course he was born of a woman. Everyone's born of a woman. But this one takes us directly from the manger to the cross. In order to save us, Jesus had to be perfect for us. He had to live a perfect life, and he had to perfectly pay the price for our sins. And that price was death. Jesus was born to die. And he could only die if he was one of us, and he indeed was. He was born of a woman, born of Mary. Next. And it also says he was born under law. What does that mean? Well, God is holy. No secret there. And God's demand for you, for me, for everybody, you got to be holy if you want a place in my family. We can't do that. We can't even come even close. So someone had to be perfect in our place. And of course, that someone was Jesus. Just think about the Ten Commandments quickly. Did Jesus always put his father first? Yes. Use his name properly and take time with his word? Absolutely. Commandments one through three. Did Jesus also um, respect those in authority, love life, keep himself pure, respect possessions, keep a good name, and have a contented heart? Yeah, he not only did that, he did it perfectly. It was absolute perfection. Born under the law all the time, yet remaining perfect, that's the one whose birth we celebrate. And it says he was born to redeem those under the law. Redeem means to to save, to win, to buy back. Imagine God came to you and said, you want to go to heaven? For the next 30 minutes, no sin. That's it. Just 30 minutes, don't sin, and you're good. Would you have any confidence after like minute five? No, we would wonder, is there some good thing I didn't do? Or did I do something bad? Or did I say something inappropriate? Did I miss someone that I could have helped and I didn't? Comfort and peace would be the last things we were experiencing. Because we can't do that. We can't bring ourselves out of the spiritual chasm that we were in. But what we couldn't do, Jesus did. He redeemed us. He paid the price. He died on that cross. That's the one whose birth we celebrate. And the end result of all this, it says Jesus was born that we might receive the full rights of sons. Paul's not being sexist here. At that time, sons are the ones who received the inheritance, and the oldest son got the most. Well, because of Christ's work, we are part of God's family. We're in the inheritance. We're in the will. And when does a will go into effect? When someone dies. Well, Jesus did die. That's why he was born. And what do we receive? Our inheritance isn't some pittance or a couple thousand dollars or mom's piano or dad's gun collection. The inheritance we receive is every good, wonderful, amazing, blessed gift that God can give. Peace, hope, forgiveness, life, certainty, salvation, and on and on it goes. And all that are, those are gifts from the one who is himself the greatest gift ever given. So yes, we celebrate Christmas today, and rightfully so. It's absolutely proper for us to gather and shout out, the Savior is born. But if we just stop there, that doesn't really mean anything. In reality, whether it's tonight or on Easter or Pentecost 14, every time we're here, we're celebrating two holidays. Oh, go back a couple. There we go. We are celebrating Christmas because the Savior had to be born. But we are also celebrating Easter and, in a way, Good Friday. Because if that Savior was just born doesn't mean anything. We need a Savior who came for us 
and died for us. Because if he didn't, our sins are still on our heads and we have to answer to God. But both these things did happen. Jesus was born. He did die. He did rise. It's a package deal and it goes absolutely wonderfully together. And when we focus on both those holidays all the time, then we realize we have every reason to have Christmas joy or whatever we want to call it right now throughout the entire year. How so? The congregation I was at before, I had to put together a children's presentation. And what we did is we made a frame, and then there were five pieces of the Christmas tree. And after each part of the presentation, a kid would go over and take part of it off. So stick with me. This gets a little tricky. So maybe we talked about the angel coming to Mary to say she's pregnant. A part was taken off. And then we talk about the angels appearing to the shepherds, and a part was taken off. And then it was the actual birth of Jesus, and a part was removed. Then it was about the shepherds coming to visit part removed. And then after the final one, when the final piece was removed, what was left? What did everyone see? What was the frame? It was the cross. And the whole point of the play was to say, you can't separate these two trees. The Christmas tree celebrating his birth and the tree of the cross recognizing and, and understanding that's what he came to do, they go hand in hand. And they do work beautifully together. The Christmas tree is absolutely fitting. Because a Christmas tree, what do we do? We look at the gifts that are under it and we take them in a good way. Well, because of Christmas, what can we take from our Savior's Christmas tree? All those things we mentioned. We take from this place joy and peace and hope and confidence and all those wonderful things. Our Savior gives us those gifts and we thank him for them. But when we also celebrate using the tree of the cross, we can realize that instead of taking something, With the cross, we leave something. The Christmas tree gifts given to us, the cross is all about what we can give to it. Like what? What things are we going to lay at the foot of the cross? Well, the first would be sin. Whatever sin you brought with you tonight, maybe it's one that's been bothering for years or it's had long-lasting repercussions, leave it. The Savior who was born and the Christ who rose paid for that sin. Stop carrying it. Leave it at the cross. We could also leave behind fear, whatever we may be fearful about, spiritual, physical, emotional, whatever. The Savior who was born and the Christ who rose rules all things and says, I got you. I'm in control. We can leave worry behind too. And isn't that a great thing? We spend all our days worrying about things we can't control. Well, the Savior who was born and the Christ who rose can control all things. And with a heart of love, he will always work all things for our good. And to round it out, we can believe two more things there. Guilt and doubt. The Savior who was born and the Christ who rose paid for all sins, so there's no guilt anymore. And as we hear that truth, he promises to send his spirit to build us up that mutes the doubter inside us. All of these are not reasons to put our heads down or to walk silently out of here. All of these are reasons to scream out, to yell out, to shout out one glorious truth. A Savior, my Savior, your Savior, was born. So yes, we celebrate Christmas today, and we rejoice over that. We're going to do it tomorrow. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's awesome. But don't just celebrate Christmas. Finish the story. Complete the mission. Rejoice that the Savior was born as the one who lived and died and rose that you might know forgiveness, that you might know a place in God's family, that you have a spot in heaven reserved. So yes, absolutely, positively, celebrate Christmas. Rejoice and shout out that a Savior is born. Complete the mission. Finish the story. Maybe sometime today or tomorrow, say to one of your relatives, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Because that's the whole story. That's the true story. And thank God, that's our story. Amen.